All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us on today's Forward Janesville Critical Topic webinar. My name is Dan Cunningham. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations and Education for Forward Janesville. And uh, today's SIP webinar is going to focus on the race for the first congressional district between Congressman Brian Stile and challenger Ann Rowe. Each candidate will have about a half hour with us, and I have a series of questions for each. Uh, both candidates will be asked the same set of questions just to keep things nice and, and level. Uh, Ms. Rowe will appear between 9 and 9.30, and then Congressman Stile will log on between 9.30 and 10 o'clock. So, in time permitting, we will take questions from the audience. If you have a question for either candidate, I ask that you direct message it to me, Dan Cunningham, in the chat function so I can curate those questions uh, time permitting. We also ask that you mute yourself during today's conversation and also don't take it personally if I just reach right out and mute you um, because we want to make sure that we're able to hear from the candidates uh, today. So without further ado, let's welcome today's first panelist, Ms. Ann Rowe. And I have a series of questions for you, as I mentioned. Uh, but I wanted to start with, please tell us about yourself and, and, and why you want this job, why you want to be our Congress uh, representative from the 1st Congressional District. So, Anne, please tell us about yourself. Thank you very much, Dan, and, and thank you all for joining me this morning. Uh, it has been an incredible journey thus far since I launched the campaign last July. And that question, why am I running? Well, that's, that's a big one. So I bring with me a career of over 30 years We've lived here in Janesville for 27 of those years where I've enjoyed a variety of uh, activities, uh, including teaching marketing at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater campus for over 20 years. So that that experience, my experience as as a mom, uh, you know, parent to kids in the district, uh, though they have graduated now, my experiences as a small business owner here where I help students navigate their post high school pathways, whatever that might look like for them. Those experiences, plus my my community experience in a variety of organizations here in Janesville and Rock County. I would just add that I was part of the teaching team for the Rock County 5.0 uh, way back when. So those experiences have definitely influenced my decision to run. The world is different than when we had our first child, Catherine, 23 years ago. Uh, at the time, I was not worried about the failure of our democracy and the um, lack of reproductive health freedom for my daughter. Uh, the world, as I said, is a different place right now, and we're facing big challenges. I cannot sit on the sidelines as I watch those pathways for our kids, those generations, narrow for them. I have to be involved. I have to go to work on behalf of them and all of us in this district. And what is, uh, in your opinion, what's the biggest issue facing the federal government in really in 2023 and, and beyond? What's your opinion of that? Well, I think you know, the overarching huge, huge issue, huge concern is the attacks on our democracy, our limitations, you know, the, from primarily the other side to limit people's access to, to voting, to limit people's access and participation in fair, safe, secure elections, which we know 2020 was the most secure we've enjoyed in, in our lifetimes. So that is overarching, coupled with troubling economic news right here in our pocketbooks, you know, on a community level. And I would say, you know, in addition to that, as if that's not enough, is the healthcare. So the pandemic really revealed the warts that we know were there in our healthcare system and really revealed the work we have yet to do to make sure everybody has access to healthcare. And, and we know from an economic standpoint, that is, that is smart for business, smart for community development, smart for all of our families across the district. When we have competitive healthcare choices, that are affordable both to the employee and to the business, right? Both win, both are more competitive. Businesses can hire competitively, people can take the jobs that suit them best. All of us know people stuck in jobs because they cannot pivot 
uh, from their current health care plans. So that uh, those those challenges are going to decide how we move forward as as a community and as a district. No shortage of challenges for sure. So if if you are to be elected next week and what what is your top legislative priority? What are you going to do first? when I'm elected next week, which is hard to believe it is indeed next week, I will fight for health care uh, to take those, that burden off of small businesses. I am a small business owner. I will fight for fair wages for our workers, especially those coming out of college, coming out of trades, coming, you know, to, to our, our first responders. You know, the starting salary here in Janesville for a firefighter is $16 an hour, $16 an hour. That is not right. So we have work to do. And while we're, while we're taking on that, education is always part of my DNA, always part of my pledge. I believe it is the key for everyone to pursue their, their dream careers, whatever that might look like after high school. So coupled with the immediate need to fix uh, and to support people, you know, as they pay higher prices at the gas pump and in the grocery stores and for childcare. So yeah, it's a hefty list. I, uh, I plan to get to work on November 9th. So Anne, let's drill down and, and get specific to, to a couple of things uh, happening here in the, in the Janesville community. Yes. Specifically, what, what do you think Congress can do to help Janesville properly develop Centennial Park, the former General Motors site, for its highest and best use? Is, is, is there a role that Congress can play in projects like that? I believe there is. I believe there is. And I want to acknowledge the tremendous Herculean task that uh, the city of Janesville has faced in converting, you know, truly a historic manufacturing site to to be in our, you know, our current our current environment, our current business environment, and be flexible enough to to look ahead to the manufacturing challenges and opportunities that come along. So I'm excited to see the intermodal rail center development, um, you know, that is possible on that site. And I also believe, and this is where I have experience. So I am a marketer through and through. That is what I had the privilege of teaching for 20 years. That is, you know, part of really truly part of helping students, you know, market themselves, if you will, uh, for their next opportunity. So I am really good at bringing people together. And when I see a, a challenge like the former GM site, Centennial Park, I think, okay, we're not the first community to have wrestled with such a challenge. So what are those other communities doing? What are those best practices? And we have, thanks to Forward Janesville, a phenomenal resource here in our community, in our county really, of realtors, of, developer, of developers and engineers. So have we tapped into that expertise, those networks, to figure out what is the best plan moving forward? Do we have all the ideas coming from you know, in and outside the box as far as how we go forward with that. As far as federal government, yeah, our local government needs an active, present federal partner to advocate and bring those resources, that expertise, funding if, if we can get it, to, to developing that site. It is a, a, a really phenomenal opportunity and yet overwhelming at the same time. So, and you may have already answered this, but you know, to broaden out a little bit, talk a little bit more about what you think the role of the federal government can be in local economic development. Is it the marketing? Is it is it some of the things you you just referred to? So, you know, given my experience over the last you know couple of decades now, um, you know, I I have enjoyed great opportunities and 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 have seen great growth within our Janesville community, within our Rock County, and several of the communities throughout the district. They've really made tremendous strides, but they're, they don't have an active partner at the federal level that 
helps them advocate for what they need. For instance, though it is a state issue, you know, municipalities, both urban and rural, especially rural, are not benefiting from a fair uh, funding um, formula used by the state. So they are not, Janesville is not getting the funding it needs uh, to, to staff fully its, its first responders and law enforcement. It's not getting that allocation in a fair and equitable manner. And I will tell you for a fact, our rural communities are not either. They are suffering. And so they are carrying this burden by themselves through their own efforts, and they need a federal partner to help advocate and and maneuver those funds to, to those actionable projects to move those communities forward. Thank you, Ann, for your thoughts yeah. on that. And next question you know some feel and, and you you read the news and you hear about this this often some feel that the u.s may be staring down a recession in 2023 what do you think specific steps congress can take uh, to address inflation and keep our economy stable what, what can congress do about that in your opinion well congress can do a lot so right now you know in the news along with the recession news is you know huge oil uh you know, corporations celebrating record profits. And oil is not alone. Pharmaceutical companies, food services, celebrating record profits, record profits. When we as, as a communities are suffering with the, the very necessities of, of getting through, right? Now my opponent takes money from those big corporations. So when it comes down to it, He's not advocating for each and one of every one of us in the district. He's responding to those big corporations. So, you know, we can we can make sure that those corporations celebrating record profits in, in some of the worst years we've faced as a as a country, they need to pay their fair share. They need to pay their fair share. Every Wisconsinite needs representation, each and every one of them. And that is, if you look at who's supporting me, we are getting broad support across the spectrum of Democrat, Republican, and independent. And these are individual donors. You know, each of those dollars carries a hope with it. And I am humbled by that. Each one of them has a hope that things are gonna get better. So as far as, as um, your question, yeah, we can fight price gouging. And that's something my opponent has resisted. So similarly, we talk a lot, we hear a lot, I should say, from our, our business partners and our members about, about workforce uh, and, and the, the lack of, of available workers to, to help fill the jobs that are out there. Uh, workforce is related to inflation and since we don't have enough workers to get our products to market. Uh, what can we do in Washington to address the lack of workers for our businesses in Janesville and Rock County, knowing that this issue is can be notoriously difficult to legislate? But what, what are your thoughts about what Congress can do to help with workforce development? Well, first, I want to compliment the city of Janesville and surrounding areas for the work that you've all done to develop, you know, what we need to not only attract but retain competitive workforce. So the you know, develop, uh, development of additional housing. We know that housing is in huge demand of, of, at every level. So that is a step. Activating and, and um, promoting our downtown businesses and not just limited to downtown, but our businesses across the city and across the county. You know, people move, move to cities that have uh, you know, something to offer beyond just a, a place to work, park for the day and head out. So Janesville in particular is made huge strides into creating a, a, a living destination, right? So those things are incredibly important. But when I work with my students, right, they're coming into a world, as I mentioned with firefighters in particular, they're coming into a world where those wages are still not competitive. You can't support a family or your dream on $16 an hour. It's, it's not possible, right? So 
fair wages, child care assistance. Let's look at what it takes for a, a person to, to get to their job, do their job, and still make enough to not only cover their expenses, but put some aside, start building on whatever their dream might look like. It's expensive. Child care is expensive. And we need people to fill those roles of child care um, workers. We need first line responders in healthcare. I spoke with a friend who, who is on a two year waiting list for a healthcare respite worker for, to come into their home, two years. So, you know, my opponent is gonna talk about, you know, reckless spending, okay not investing in what people need in those fundamental things like housing, childcare, education, that's not saving money. That's putting us further and further back. That is having us, you know, um, get, get the short end of the stick while he is taking care of his big donors and supporters. So I'd like to remind everybody that uh, I've got a set of questions that I'm going to ask to both candidates and, and I'm working through that right now, but if you have a question for Ms. Rowe or for Fry and Style at 930, please private message it to me, Dan Cunningham, in the chat function and we'll see if we can, we've got time to get to those here at the end. But I do have a couple more questions and um, what is your position on federal earmarks? And, and for those of you who don't know, this can get inside baseball a little bit here, but uh, earmarks are a way for individual members of Congress to request funding for a project directly during the budget process. This can be a sensitive topic, frankly. I mean, you hear about bringing home the bacon, right, pork belly spending and whatnot from Washington. But, but to be perfectly honest, there are projects in Janesville right now that could use an infusion of federal dollars. And what's your, what's your position on earmarks? You know, uh, earmarks are really... Um, you know, powerful, powerful tools when used correctly, right? So they are a tool to benefit constituents or community members right at the local level. So they they shouldn't be used to, to vote for bills, say, that would otherwise, you know, um, compromise the values of our district or compromise the values of our constituents and people in that district, okay? So for instance, We've, we all know about the infrastructure bill, um, which is historical in nature and, and, and hugely impactful. And as you know, um, probably most of you, it was a partisan issue. It shouldn't have been at all. As I said, you know, by not investing, we're just kicking the can down the road for our generations to bear the burden of, right? So my opponent did not support the infrastructure bill, okay? Interestingly enough, Many of his Republican counterparts, many of his Republican counterparts did request funds from that infrastructure bill. So he said that House Democrats reversed the ban on earmarks and have accelerated new wasteful inefficient spending. Not true. So what happened with earmarks is that Democratic administration sort of made that a, a, a more robust process. So requests can be posted online by their congressional sponsors and lawmakers have to certify, you know, that they and their immediate families, you know, have no financial interest. They will not benefit from, from such a, a project and, and earmarks cannot benefit for-profit ventures, right? So it's a pretty robust process and it is a really effective way for a federal representative, like a congressperson, to work really closely with the communities within that district to move forward the very specific projects that they know they need. Who better knows, you know, what is needed to move Janesville, Rock County, Kenosha, Racine, Beloit, who knows better than the people on the ground looking at, at, at the current situation as far as what they need. So, Earmarks, you know, can't be more than 1% of discretionary spending, right? And members are, are limited as far as how many earmarks they can request. So this, this really relies on very close, active working relationship between the congressperson 
and the community leaders and advocates for what they're looking at in their communities. Thank you, Anne. We've uh, we've actually we're going to shift gears here. I've got my first audience question, and it actually is a great one because it's an issue that we've been talking about at Forward Angel for for a long time, really throughout the pandemic and even before that. So, child care is very important, but the wages of child care workers are extremely low. What can be done to increase the wages of child care workers while still making it accessible and affordable to families? So thanks again to the audience for that question. And what are, what are your thoughts about child care and what, what Congress can do in that regard? Well, look, you know, we are, we are in a business community right here, you know, with all the participants this morning. So child care, you know, as, as, as a, a community business and community service, is critical to allowing workers to get where they need to be. And, you know, they demand, rightly so, rightly so, as we would for all of our children, a safe, healthy, you know, um, active environment for, for those children to move on. We know that, that pre, you know, pre-kindergarten uh, educational experiences and care experiences really shape how that child grows into their K through 12 experiences. So I cannot put enough emphasis or importance on, on, on great child care um, offerings. And from a business perspective, we, we, know how to, we know how to start businesses, right? We have resources in each of our communities now with with jumpstart rock county down in beloit we have forward janesville all sorts of community resources here in janesville we have similar resources in Racine and kenosha we know how to help people start that up but what's critical is that they get the training at an affordable price so that they are not coming in burdened to begin with when they start their business child care workers you know require licensing they require you know um education development courses all sorts of background to make that business not only successful but you know long lasting and sustained and thank you for that we were kind of getting close to the end of our time with you so i i wanted to here comes the big pitch right uh tell us why voters should elect you next week on november 8th Look, I, you know, I am 56. I will tell you that running for federal office is not for the faint of heart. And this has been by far the most uh, rewarding, incredible experience uh, that I have, I have embarked on in my entire 30 year plus career. And, you know, as an active leader here in the Janesville community, Rock County, as an active educator, as an active advocate for small businesses and our, our students coming out of high school, people know what they're getting with me. And they, they have come to rely on my presence, you know, throughout the community on a sustained and, and active level. And it, I am doing what I love in helping my community move forward. So, you know, I know that is why I am earning the support of Republicans, especially farmers who have been loud as far as their, you know, departure from, from their former party. I am getting support from independents, I'm getting support from Democrats. And it's because you know what you're getting with me. I bring people together. I am interested in everyone's success. I want our communities to move forward. And I believe in public service, which means service without judgment. We serve everybody. That is, that is the mission of government. And it is the mission of government to uphold the Constitution and to call out what's wrong without fear of repercussions from my party, right? So I would humbly ask you for your support and your vote on Tuesday, November 8th. To learn more about my campaign, you can certainly check out AnnRoeForCongress.com. Uh, I am the pro-choice candidate on this in this race and um, happy to talk to you individually anytime, but I really appreciate this opportunity to be with you this morning. 
and it's been great to have you and and i i wish you the best of luck next week i know you've worked extremely hard and it's it's you know we're involved in other things and it's always a pleasure to talk to you so thank you again for joining us uh today on this this critical topic webinar we're going to take a short break uh and and wait for congressman style to join us at 9 30 so you're welcome to uh get to your emails or, or do whatever you'd like for the next few minutes but i do want to review the rules with everybody I've muted everybody, so don't be offended if, if you've been muted uh, by me, because we want to make sure that our speakers are, are able to be heard. I have a set of questions for both candidates, and I'm going to go down and ask them both the same questions, but you do have an opportunity to ask questions by private messaging them to me, Dan Cunningham, in the chat function. So with that, we're going we're gonna to take a pause for a minute. Thanks again, Anne, for joining us. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Best of luck next week, and uh, we'll be back with you all in just a few minutes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Well, thanks again, everybody, for, for sticking with us here. We're, we're thrilled to have Congressman Brian Stile join us here from 930 until about 955 or so. Uh, Congressman, I'll, I'll tell everybody about the rules here just to remind everybody. I've got a, a set of questions for you um, that I'll go through. And then uh, audience members can can ask a question or submit a question to you by direct messaging it to me in the chat function. So please go ahead and do that if you have a question for the congressman. But without further ado, we'll we'll get to it. So, Congressman, you know, we know you at Forward Janesel. We, we've been talking to you for years, but uh, it occurs to me that not everyone may know you. So here's an opportunity. Please tell us about yourself and and why you are continuing to want the job of being our first congressional district representative in the in the U.S. Congress. Tell us about yourself. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for everybody for joining us on what is probably the last absolutely stunningly beautiful day before it starts snowing again in Wisconsin. Uh, but in a serious sense, um, born and raised in Janesville, as many of you uh, likely know, and still uh, live here today uh, and call this great community home. Uh, before I ran for Congress, I spent a decade uh, working in the local manufacturing industry. I spent about nine years or so uh, working at Regal Beloit Corporation, motion control, industrial manufacturer, uh, with factories uh, around the state uh, as well as around the globe, uh, and then worked at Charter Next Generation, a plastics manufacturing company, uh, headquartered in Milton, Wisconsin, uh, with uh, a growing footprint uh, in this uh, southeast uh, Wisconsin region and in the uh, Rock County region in particular. Um, and so I think I have a unique background in understanding the challenges uh, so many of our businesses uh, in Janesville and in the Rock County area uh, face uh, to really grow and expand uh, and ultimately help the workers uh, who are the driving force behind all of the businesses uh, in our community. In Congress, I've worked really hard to try to be available and accessible. Uh, anytime people uh, need anything, I, I work my, uh, my tail off uh, to be available to people. Uh, we've helped countless people uh, who have needed assistance cutting through uh, government red tape on a regular basis. And then from a policy perspective, we need to really substantively and dramatically get our country back on course. We've seen two years of really aggressive, reckless spending uh, in Washington, one of the key drivers of inflation. Uh, we've seen a war on domestic production of energy, driving costs higher for families. Uh, and I think from a federal perspective, those are the top two issues that we need to be focused on uh, to get our country back on track and help workers here in Southeast Wisconsin. Congressman, you touched on it, but tell us more. What, what are the biggest issues facing the federal government in 2023 and beyond? Uh, you touched on it, but please uh, please go further. Yeah, the, the, it's the cost of living, Dan. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I have talked to uh, over the, the course of this campaign, over the course, really, uh, of the last year plus, uh, who are struggling to afford the things that their families need. And there's policies that we could change in Washington uh, that can help families who are struggling to pay the bills. Uh, so in particular, we need to unleash American energy. We're going to have a transition to more cleaner. There's going to be more wind, more solar, more nuclear, more, more hydro. Uh, but the question is, what does this transition look like? Uh, and the Biden administration has tried to force this transition upon the backs of working families. We've seen gas prices dramatically increase. Uh, home heating bills for families in our region uh, are estimated to increase well north of $100 uh, a family. And so the question is, how do we address that situation? I think we need uh, to really develop a domestic energy supply uh, rather than having a president of the United States that's going to places like Saudi Arabia 
uh, begging them uh, to actually release more energy. And it doesn't just show up at the, at the gas pump. It doesn't just show up uh, when you are trying to heat your home this winter. Um, but it also shows up at places like the grocery store because it's a diesel tractor in the fields. Uh, they're out there right now uh, collecting uh, the harvest. Uh, and it's a diesel truck that's going to bring it to the grocery store. Uh, and in our region, it's a gas powered um, power plant uh, that is running the electricity uh, to keep all those goods cold and keep the lights on uh, at the grocery store. The other piece of this, Dan, that is a huge issue is the wild and reckless spending we've seen over the course of the past two years. It's been a challenging four years. So let me go back a little further for a second because we saw a lot of government intervention uh, in the height of COVID. During a national emergency uh, such as COVID was, and in particular, as we saw governments trying to shut businesses down, it was important for the government to act. We didn't want people to lose their homes, to be unable to pay the rent or pay the mortgage or cover a grocery bill. And overall, uh, that program worked reasonably well. We kept people in their homes. Uh, we kept people uh, from some of the most dire consequences of having governments close businesses. But as we came out of that, instead of returning and getting our country back on track post-pandemic, what we saw was the continuation of excessive spending that is actually fueling the inflation we feel every day. And so getting that inflation under control is going to require to address the reckless spending and unleashing American energy. Uh, later today, we're going to see the Fed uh, announce their most recent interest rate move, most likely a 75 uh, basis point increase, just a little less than 1% uh, in interest. And as we sit as a nation with a $31 trillion debt, every 1%, we got some math people and business people here, so I, I'm going to get the num numbers for a second, Dan, but every 1% movement on interest rates on a $31 trillion debt is rough math, $300 billion. And interest rates are continuing to climb. And so the pressure on the federal budget going forward to unwind uh, the disaster of uh, economic spending from Washington is going to be really challenging. And I'll tell you, I think that's the number one issue uh, for our federal government in the years ahead. Thank you for that, Congressman. So if, if reelected within your own office, what, what's your top legislative priority? What bills are you thinking about introducing uh, in, the new, in the new Congress in January? What, 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 what are your thoughts there? Great question, Dan. So it, in my opinion, the best case scenario uh, from my perspective here is we're going to enter divided government. And so the most likely scenario, if Republicans take the House, Biden will remain as president. And we'll have a Senate with less than 60 votes on either side, meaning neither Republicans or Democrats will have 60 votes in the Senate that could break through uh, a filibuster. In that case, the question is going to be what bills can we work on uh, with the president to drive this forward? And can we see a significant shift uh, from the administration on key policies. So one is going to be to address the spending. So Congress has kicked the can down the road now uh, for quite some time. The fiscal year, so the, your federal government doesn't operate on a calendar year, we operate on a fiscal year. The fiscal year concluded, uh, but yet the can was kicked down the road. So we're operating right now on last year's budget. Think of it that way. So we have a huge bill coming before us that's to fund the regular operations of the federal government. Setting forward the priorities uh, in that bill and controlling the total dollar spend uh, is going to be probably the most important piece of legislation that you're going to see come out of a divided government. So everything in there uh, from the importance of securing the border to strengthening the United States military in a really dangerous world, uh, while at the same time identifying those priorities and finding areas uh, where we can reduce spending so we can control the top dollar amount is probably the most significant and important piece of legislation. And as you know me, Dan, I'm a guy uh, that gets in the weeds. And so we'll be digging through that and working through different amendments uh, inside that bill to try to uh, move our country forward. Thank you, Congressman. So I want to get a little bit local here and, and talk a little bit about economic development. Are there things you think Congress can do to help James will properly develop Centennial Park, uh, the former General Motors site for its highest and best use? Is there a role for Congress in this? And, and wanted to get your thoughts generally about the role that the federal government can play in economic development. Sure, great question. So, so let, me get, let me get local and then let me broaden that out a bit as well. Um, so as it relates to that specific facility or any facility uh, that the city of Janesville is ready to engage in, uh, I stand ready and willing to assist uh, as the city or any municipality moves through uh, a grant application process. And so we've done that a number of times successfully uh, with other municipalities around Southeast Wisconsin. 
Um, I know we're working uh, in Janesville in particular on moving uh, that process forward so that we get the full redevelopment uh, done. But as the city in particular, or in, in collaboration with Forward Janesville, uh, identifies any federal grants of interest, um, I stand ready and willing uh, to assist uh, in that process. And like I said, we've done that uh, in other regions. Um, that said then, big picture, the federal government's best role uh, is to make sure that we have a robust economic uh, agenda at the federal level developing growth here locally. So if we go back uh, before the pandemic, we saw really successful uh, tax reform done uh, at the federal level. Uh, those reforms had a significant benefit uh, to workers here in Southeast Wisconsin. We saw real wages rising, uh, not only across the board at record numbers, uh, but actually above the average, we saw Blacks, Hispanics, Asians, whites, uh, Asians, women, veterans. Um, and so that, that broader tax structure uh, can be of significant benefit. And as we keep a, a sustainable tight labor market, uh, we can actually really dramatically benefit workers here uh, in Southeast Wisconsin. Thank you, Congressman. So this, this question may feel a little bit redundant, but I did have a list of questions that I wanted to go down. So if, if, we're, if we're doubling back on territory here, forgive me. But again, we talked about the fears of a recession uh, potentially in 2023. Um, what do you think Congress can specifically do to address uh, inflation and keep our economy stable and, and moving forward? No, great, great question. And, and admittedly, I'm very concerned uh, about where we're at um, economically. Not only do we see challenging headwinds here uh, domestically, but also at a, a global perspective, uh, we have really challenging foreign policy uh, items in front of us. Not only uh, the unjust, unprovoked uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, we have China being hostile towards Taiwan. Uh, we also have um, you also have North Korea firing missiles, not only uh, over South Korea and over, over Japan. And so as we look at this, I'm, I'm very concerned about the direction that we're headed. Um, to unwind this situation, it's really gonna take hard work to address uh, the reckless spending that's been going on in Washington uh, for far too long, uh, but at a really dramatic and accelerated pace uh, over the course of the Biden administration. And so the challenge in front of us is gonna be to get our spending, uh, our spending balance back out. It's gonna be unleashing American energy, and then the piece that we haven't probably talked enough about is we continue to see COVID era policies uh, allowing people uh, to find themselves on the sidelines rather than getting back to work. And I can't tell you how many uh, business owners and managers uh, and employees were frustrated that there aren't enough workers uh, in our economy. And so one of the things that we should really be looking at in a nonpartisan way in Washington is what labor policies can we address to help people find, find themselves that how can we help people that are finding themselves on the sideline? How can we help them get back to work? And there's, I think, a number of labor policies uh, that were put in place uh, during the pandemic uh, that we ultimately need to rip the Band-Aid off of to help people get back to work. And I think that is going to be uh, the third key driver here to bring inflation down from a policy perspective uh, at the federal level. Sorry about that technological snafu there. Um, but you just talked about uh, workforce, which was kind of the next question on the list. But I, I think you've, you've gone over some, some ideas and, and policies that the federal government could, could adopt to, to get people off the sidelines and back to work. Because we're hearing it every day from our businesses that, that they don't have the labor they need to do their jobs well and to, to make their businesses prosper. Are there other specific things that you'd, you'd like to go into to talk about workforce, or is it really just ending those, those COVID era policies uh, that you think is the key driver there? Actually, I think one of the, the areas that we should see a lot more work on, uh, it looks like we got some folks maybe from uh, Blackhawk Tech on here as well, um, is we need to, to further integrate our high school curriculum and education into our direct workforce needs uh, here in Janesville and in Southeast Wisconsin and in Southern Wisconsin. What do I mean by that? We have seen some uh, really uh, kind of cutting edge uh, development uh, in this space in our region. I was just in Elkhorn the other day uh, where they have an apprenticeship program with a, a tool and die maker called Precision Plus, uh, where they bring folks uh, directly in in their last two years of high school, uh, where they can do an apprenticeship uh, and really learn high tech manufacturing. This isn't manufacturing uh, from 100 years ago where you got to carry a 50 pound sack over your shoulder. Uh, this is manufacturing where you got to be using your mind and your hands. Uh, to get the job done and ultimately be able to, re to ultimately be able to obtain uh, a family sustaining wage. And so 
inside that that broader context, I would love to see us continue that development as it relates uh, to integrating our technical college curriculum directly into our high schools. And in fact, uh, I'm the ranking member on uh, the Select Committee on what's called Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth, what I call uh, the economy. Uh, and we brought uh, a full committee hearing uh, over to Kenosha, the other side of the congressional district, Democrats and Republicans alike, uh, to sit down and learn uh, what the technical college uh, in that region uh, is doing, which is cutting edge, and how we can help roll that out nationally. What are the challenges they face? And I'll tell you one challenge that I think we continue to see uh, is the accreditation process uh, of integrating our technical college curriculum into our high schools. And if we could do a better job of that at the federal level, it's something that I've spent a lot of time working on. I actually think we could really enhance the education curriculum here in Janesville uh, and truly tie it out to the local uh, workforce needs, not only to the benefit of, of the ultimate worker or the student as they go through the process, but also taxpayers uh, because we can shift that education curriculum into the senior year of high school, lowering the burden uh, for everybody as that uh, student becoming a worker uh, ultimately graduates. I think it would be a, a huge development in our region, something I've spent uh, a lot of time in uh, in my four years in Congress. Very interesting. Thank you for your thoughts on that, Congressman. And I wanted to remind uh, those on the call here that if you would be interested in submitting a question for the Congressman, you can direct message it to me Dan Cunningham and the chat function, and we can get to that. I do have a couple of questions uh, remaining, um, and this one this one can be it can be a sensitive topic, I guess. Uh, what is your position on federal earmarks? And, and for those of you on the call who aren't aware of what that means, it's really a way for individual members of Congress to request funding for a project directly during the budget process. Like I said, this can be a sensitive topic, but there are projects in Janesville that could use an infusion of federal dollars. So give us your thoughts on earmarks, Congressman. No, great, great question, Dan. So as, as you may know, but maybe not everyone on the call, uh, the, in two years ago, uh, Congress changed the policy as related to earmarks and reinstated what is now uh, congressionally uh, directed funding. Um, I have a review process. And if I believe uh, that a congressional um, review or congressionally directed spending uh, is appropriate, I would consider it. But, but the challenge that we have seen uh, over the past two years is really aggressive uh, federal government spending. We have a state government right now that's sitting on approximately $5 billion uh, of cash that's going out uh, the door from the state level. Um, we see municipalities, uh, cities and cities and other municipalities uh, receive millions of dollars. Janesville, of course, uh, one of the beneficiaries of some of those programs. And so as we look at this, we have a huge challenge uh, with the total amount of federal spending. So the standard for me uh, for a congressionally directed uh, spending uh, uh, note would, is pretty high, uh, but definitely I would consider reviewing any program uh, that the city would submit um, and review that process going forward. The other area there, Dan, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is often uh, municipalities such as Janesville uh, apply for federal grants. And I always stand ready and willing and able uh, to assist uh, municipalities in our region or other um, uh, other agencies uh, to assist them in that grant making process. Thank you for that. So I've reached my last question, which is is kind of the big pitch, uh, Congressman. Why should voters reelect you on November eighth? Yeah, well, I'm I'm running for for reelection because we got a lot of work to do. We got to get our country uh, back on track, and this being kind of Janesville's Chamber of Commerce. Uh, which I've known uh, most of you, I think, for a very long time. I think we need to make dramatic uh, change from an economic policy perspective in Washington. Uh, we need to put a check on the Biden administration to be able to do that. And so I've been working uh, for the past four years across the aisle uh, with my colleagues to make sure that we're trying to move our country forward. And in a period of time uh, where we've seen aggressive spending, where we're facing uh, the challenges of inflation, where so many moms and dads are making choices at the grocery store about what to buy. They're making choices about whether or not they're going to uh, jump in their car and drive knowing the price of gas. Uh, we need to dramatically change course in Washington. Uh, and I look for, and I ask for your vote uh, next Tuesday uh, to be able to continue that work and to get our country uh, back on track then. Thank you, Congressman. So in the time when we've uh, been talking here about this last question, a question is coming from the audience. What is being done to protect our critical infrastructure from an IT cybersecurity perspective? You got any thoughts on that? I'm yeah, sure. this is a huge challenge. And I, I spent a fair amount of time uh, in this space. So as mentioned earlier, I serve on, on three different committees. One of them 
uh, is the Financial Services Committee, which picks up uh, a lot of our financial uh, infrastructure, uh, which is obviously very IT dependent. And so when we look at this, this is going to take a multi-jurisdictional approach. And so we not only have uh, individual bad actors domestically, we have international gangs, kind of individuals, as well as state actors uh, abroad who are engaged uh, in this type of activity on a regular basis. And so not only do individual businesses need to remain vigilant, as you would uh, if there was a criminal coming uh, to rob your business, uh, but we also need to have the investment of the federal government uh, to, to assist kind of in the backbone of the security infrastructure. And then the final piece of that is actually holding the countries that are allowing this uh, to occur in their jurisdiction accountable. Uh, two of the most egregious actors right now uh, are Iran uh, in Russia. And so being forceful uh, with these countries uh, is going to be one of the most important things we can do from a national security perspective, because it's only not it's not only kinetic warfare, right, missiles and bombs, uh, but it's also this more cyber and IT based warfare, uh, which we're seeing on the front lines. And so when we look at the investment in the United States military and in the CIA, other other agencies of the federal government uh, that work in this space, making sure that they're funded and have the tools that they need uh, are going to be absolutely essential. And so from a federal government perspective, you have holding countries accountable, you have the assistance that is kind of the backbone of this security structure, but then integrating that and working uh, with the private sector, who are truly often the front lines of much of this uh, IT infrastructure. Well, Congressman, it's been wonderful to chat with you here this morning. I know you're extremely busy six days out on uh, from Election Day. Things can get a little crazy on a campaign. So we, we very much appreciate you taking a few minutes with this audience. Uh, for those of you on the call, again, we did record this call. We'll share this out. So I encourage you to share the recording of this call with friends, neighbors, and colleagues, and also encourage you to visit our website, forwardjanesville.com under what we do slash government relations. Uh, there's an election page that lists all the races and it also has some links to helpful information about uh, precinct information, where you vote, what's gonna be on your ballot, all that good stuff. So please do go and vote on November 8th, next Tuesday. If not before, there are opportunities to, to go vote early and, and do all that good stuff. So please make sure to vote. And again, share this information with friends and colleagues. So with that, I'd like to thank Congressman Brian Stahl for being on with us today. Thanks, Brian. Best of luck next week. And uh, we hope to speak to you soon. Thank you, sir. Thank, thanks so much, Dan. Thanks for everyone for joining. Have a wonderful day. And thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we're, we're gonna try to get some more of these calls up before next week. So stay tuned for information on that. But in the meantime, enjoy your day and don't forget to vote on November 8th. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.